It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the 2022 DC Blood Oration. Um, and this year we'll be uh, using the occasion to celebrate two former deans of the University of Melbourne's Veterinary School. Um, I should probably start by introducing myself. I'm John Fazakli. I'm the Dean of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences, um, the two now being joined up. And secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the stewardship of the lands we stand on today uh, and recognize the traditional owners and custodians, the, the Boon Wurrung people. Um, this stewardship over tens of thousands of years has endowed to us Australia's wonderful plants, animals, and landscapes. And I pay my respects to the indigenous elders, past, present, and emerging, and I extend that to any indigenous people joining us today. And I'd like to acknowledge the role of indigenous knowledge in our academy. Professor Douglas Charles Blood was appointed Professor of Veterinary Medicine and Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary Sciences here at the University of Melbourne in 1962. He was the founding dean of the modern University of Melbourne Veterinary School. And his remit was to re-establish the veterinary school. And he became the driving force behind the initial curriculum, the new buildings, both here at Werribee and at Parkville, and the selection of the first staff and students and establishment of the teaching hospital and its ambulatory teaching clinic. In recognition of his contribution to veterinary science, Professor Blood received several awards and honorary degrees. He was an officer of the Order of the British Empire and an honorary associate of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. He received the Schofield Medal and an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Guelph, an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Saskatchewan, the Gilruth Prize from the Australian Veterinary Association and an honorary doctor of veterinary science from the University of Melbourne. His seminal text on livestock diseases, written with Jim Henderson, called Veterinary Medicine, has had now 11 editions, um, several co-authors and many translations. And among its latest authors is Professor Ken Hinchcliffe, Dean of this faculty more recently, who's here tonight. It's thanks to the solid foundation that Professor Blood laid down and all those that have walked these halls since, that the Melbourne Veterinary School is recognized as a global leader in veterinary higher education. Professor Blood had a lifelong devotion to learning and teaching, and it's in his memory that we hold tonight's annual oration. This year's orator is Professor Colin Wilkes. Colin graduated in veterinary science from the University of Melbourne in 1968, the second cohort of students of the re-established school of which Professor Blood was dean. He then spent a few years in rural practice before returning to the university to start his postgraduate training in virology with subsequent positions at Cornell University and the Royal Veterinary College in London. Colin's career has included periods leading laboratory teams in disease diagnosis and research within the Victorian Department of Agriculture, teaching and research at Massey University and here at the University of Melbourne, and as an international consultant for developmental agencies in Africa, Eastern Europe, and in Central and Southeast Asia. In his retirement, Colin has continued to assist with PhD co-supervision and in mentoring development and education programs in Cambodia. This year, we were very proud to award Colin an honorary doctorate of veterinary science from the University of Melbourne. Please join me in welcoming Professor Colin Wilkes. Colin. <laughs> Well, thank you, John, for that very kind uh, welcome and in introduction, and uh, thank you all for uh, being here uh, tonight. Uh, to say that it's uh, an honour and a privilege to be presenting the DC Blood Oration in 2022 uh, is really the understatement of the century. Um, I was uh, very fortunate to be a member of, uh, as John has said, the uh, second cohort of students that were uh, 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 that entered the uh, Melbourne Veterinary School, uh, headed by uh, Professor uh, Blood. And we had the remarkable experience of being a small group of students. When, when I started, there were only the two years in the course. So we had far more uh, contact with Doug than uh, would be usual for students uh, interacting with the dean of, of a faculty. Although I know that that 
closeness between deans and the students has continued as something of a tradition and a culture uh, at, uh, at, at this uh, particular faculty. But I consider myself extremely fortunate to have uh, joined the faculty at that time. When I was uh, deciding to talk about this topic of, uh, and address the question of whether veterinary science is still relevant in its present form uh, in the 21st century, I was aware that my thinking was influenced by a couple of papers that I had read over the last 20 years that have come uh, out of um, Canada. Uh, the first paper uh, suggests that um, if the veterinary profession in the 21st century were subjected to the lifeboat test, uh, then we perhaps would not earn a place on the lifeboat. Uh, the argument that they advance goes a little that 75% of uh, veterinarians in North America are working in companion animal practice. And while this is seen quite rightly as uh, in many ways exemplifying the very best of the profession in terms of skills, technical uh, um, expertise and service to a client base that is seeking those services. If we look at some of the big issues of the 21st century, uh, Ted uh, Layton argues, uh, then the veterinary profession is not really addressing those and is perhaps not well equipped to address them. And he suggests that if society were on the Titanic, the Titanic hit an iceberg, limited number of uh, places on the few lifeboats that are left then along with uh, jewellers, fashion designers, veterinarians will be left leaning over the railing as the boat sinks, watching the lifeboats uh, sail away. Um, I don't feel entirely comfortable with that, uh, uh, that assumption. And if we consider what's happened in the last few years when, in fact, society hit iceberg COVID-19, uh, we, in fact, saw... Uh, the veterinary profession and companion animal veterinarians uh, regarded very highly in the services required. And one is reminded that uh, man doesn't live by bread alone and there are more things to life than uh, just getting enough food and having shelter uh, over your head. The second paper, also out of um, Canada, I think some bad things must have been happening in Canada at the time because... <laughs> Three uh, former deans uh, joined that previous author and they concluded that the uh, curriculum was uh, quite inappropriate in its present form and we should be following a curriculum more along the lines of uh, engineering schools where after the basic sciences are laid down, there is then total streaming, so you either became a mechanical engineer or an electrical engineer or whatever. Uh, Again, uh, I don't feel entirely comfortable with that and I guess when we look at the uh, present curriculum at the Melbourne School, it's, um, it's, it's addressed some of these issues here but it still retains uh, what I think are the most appropriate links uh, back to the original format of uh, what a veterinary curriculum uh, was, uh, was seen to be. So I'd like to approach uh, the question a little bit by looking at what were the drivers of the first veterinary school, uh, the school at Lyon in France that was founded in uh, 1761. And then almost exactly 200 years later, what were the drivers for the re-establishment of the Melbourne Veterinary School? Why was it seen important that that, that should occur? The uh, first question is pretty easy to answer. Uh, in Europe at the time, uh, the cattle disease rinderpest was raging uh, right across Europe decimating uh, cattle herds if the uh, viral infection, uh, I should warn you, you will notice that there's a bit of a theme of viruses uh, all the way through this talk. Um, uh, I have to admit that uh, that's where my interests are, so I'm choosing those examples. If you want to hear about different things, then you'd better invite a different speaker next year <laughs> and they'll address those. Um, so rinderpest, absolutely devastating. And just as we've discovered with COVID, it's not only the direct effects of an infectious agent on the sick and dying individuals, it's the social impact that, uh, that may occur because of disruptions to all of those other areas of society. When this was occurring in France, the uh, king at the time, Louis XV, noticed that within the country, there wasn't any body of people who were trained, educated, able to cope with dealing with diseases and infections in, in animals. So he charged uh, where are Claude Beaujolais, 
not Beaujolais, Beaujolais, Beaujolais is the drinking one. Um, <laughs> From Lyon, so perhaps not, not so bad. There's, uh, that's, it's quite a wine, uh, wine area in France. Uh, Claude was um, uh, a query of uh, uh, the equestrian events. He already had established himself by a young age as a writer, a philosopher. He was connected with the intelligentsia in France and he was seen as a person who could put together and run a veterinary school, whatever that was uh, conceived to be. He'd also spent a fair bit of time looking at medical education and he'd seen that that was based on a sound knowledge of anatomy, uh, physiology as much as that was known at the time, uh, experimental evidence and empirical evidence, observation of what was actually happening. And that was the uh, course that he laid down as the very first curriculum. He was charged with producing a body of people who could control Rinderpest. He had uh, money for a few years to do that, but each uh, course of instruction went for one year. Uh, students were selected on the basis of having a baptismal certificate and a letter of recommendation. So if you'd been baptised and your mum wrote you a note, you could get into veterinary school. Uh, <coughs> the first cohort of students, and you could start at any time during the year that you like. Uh, the first cohort ranged in age from 11 years old to 30 years old. So things were rather different, but the structure of the curriculum was, uh, we can see the basis of, uh, of where more modern curricula have, uh, have come from. His students uh, were involved in practical work, involved in disease control as part of the course, and within that first year, Rinderpest had been brought under control in France. Uh, how much of that was due to the natural uh, surging and abatement of, uh, of epidemics anyway, uh, we'll probably never know, but uh, the, the school was given credit for it. Uh, they were designated as a royal uh, academy uh, and funding was continued on. And that original school became the pattern for uh, extra schools throughout France. Um, Bourgelat went on to establish the second uh, veterinary school in, in Paris this time. Uh, other countries in Europe followed the model, the UK, Scotland and so on afterwards and around the world. One of the big decisions that he did make from the outset was that he was going to establish a profession. And professions exist uh, at the pleasure of the society that they serve. So there was a social contract, if you like, that if a body of learned individuals had skills, could provide services, and society decided that they wanted this and trusted the body to self-regulate, uh, to maintain appropriate educational standards, standards of ethics, and to police itself, if you like. Uh, that was the basis of a profession. He could well have decided to establish a guild, a trade guild or something of the sort, but that was not uh, his vision for a veterinary profession that would, uh, would go on and as we know it today. We jump ahead 200 years and uh, as uh, the Dean has already mentioned, uh, Douglas Charles Blood was appointed as the uh, Professor of Veterinary Science and Dean of, uh, and given the charge to build, quite literally, uh, to develop the curriculum and to recruit the staff for the re-establishment of, uh, of the veterinary school. And I think it reflected very well Doug's own interests that uh, he set up a school in three with three departments, uh, preclinical, paraclinical and clinical. No guesses where Doug's interests were and what he saw was important. Um, at an early uh, veterinary students conference, uh, Ken Jubb, who was appointed uh, shortly after Doug's appointment as the uh, professor of veterinary pathology said that, uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, that if he'd been appointed as the dean, it would have been pre-pathology, pathology, <laughs> and applied pathology. So, <clears throat> but Doug had certainly uh, seen it that way. Now, I said we were very fortunate being a small group of students 
Uh, Doug was not, uh, when he wasn't uh, wandering the, the campus with architects deciding on buildings and where things would go, uh, uh, finding out where more money was going to be obtained to, uh, to, to get those buildings done. Uh, he didn't have to spend so much time, well, the third, fourth and fifth year students weren't there when I started, so he actually spent quite a bit of time teaching in first year and there was an excellent course, I found it excellent, called Introduction to Veterinary Science. And Doug told us uh, stories, gave us an introduction to the profession, an introduction to the scope of things that veterinarians uh, do. Uh, there are also practical classes in how to handle animals and, and, and so on. One of the stories that uh, stuck with me, and we'll come back to it a little bit later, was uh, it was almost case-based learning, I guess, he was doing, but it wouldn't have been called that at the time. It was just Doug teaching. Um, he told us about an outbreak of congenital abnormalities in cattle in New South Wales. And as he'd done with sort of more straightforward clinical cases, he interacted with the students, he asked us questions, we threw up ideas, um, he shot them down mostly, but uh, worked through it so that we were part of the learning process with him. And we explored such things as if you had congenital or abnormalities, what sort of things might cause that? Is this going to be an infectious or a nutritious? Or, and it was happening in newborn animals, so when would the uh, pathogenic insult have occurred? And we gradually reasoned back that maybe this was something that had happened partway through pregnancy and had interrupted the growth phase. So Doug said, pay attention to embryology when you're learning that in a couple of years' time because this will help you stage when that happened. Um, it wasn't known at that time what the cause of that outbreak was. We now know about it, and when I talk a little later about another more recent outbreak of a similar disease, we can link it back and I'll fill in the rest of that story. Uh, I thought you might like to see the... Um, that was the total faculty of the school back in 1964. And if you read uh, Doug's um, excellent history of the first 30 years of the founding school, you'll find that uh, he was paid the princely salary of £4,500 uh, for establishing the school. I haven't equated that to what, uh, what might be paid to a professor these days, but uh, it was enough, fortunately, to attract him to come back to Australia from, uh, from Canada to do the job that he did. So I'd like to go through a few instances of where veterinarians have responded to challenges and issues um, since the time that the Melbourne Veterinary School was set up and have a look at whether the sort of education that we got then fitted us to acquire additional uh, education and learning or to act in a way, look at solving problems with the sort of uh, modus operandi that we had been taught uh, for dealing with uh, diagnostic cases, whether that in fact has held us in good stead. The first person I wanted us to focus on, and you may or may not have uh, heard of Max Essex, he was a graduate from Michigan University, he graduated the same year as the first cohort of students graduated from the uh, re-established Melbourne Veterinary School. He went on to uh, Davis University in uh, California where he studied feline retroviruses for his PhD. And he was particularly interested in the interaction of this group of viruses, the feline retroviruses, with the immune system. And he recorded some of the earliest uh, reports and explanations of why you got such severe immune depression in cats infected with uh, some of the feline retroviruses. He moved from there to uh, Harvard University to the Department of Health Sciences. Uh, he had a distinguished career there and ended up as uh, Professor Emeritus of Health Sciences at Harvard and Chair of the Harvard AIDS Institute in Botswana. Uh, along the way, he picked up the Lasca Prize in Medicine, which is the top award uh, for medical science in North America, and he shared that with Robert Gallo and Luke Montagna. Now, it'll be no surprise if I tell you that he made a major contribution to our understanding of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Uh, I heard him present this material in 1983 
uh, when we didn't know what the cause of this epidemic that was sweeping uh, North America at the time was caused by. There were all sorts of speculations. But looking at it and taking a comparative veterinary virology uh, mind, he reasoned that this epidemic was behaving like a transmissible disease. It apparently had a long incubation period. There were quite specific immune uh, abnormalities that were caused in people who suffered from the condition. And at the time, there was a uniformly fatal outcome. And he argued that, uh, well, this looks awfully like a retrovirus that I've been looking at in cats. So I think this may well be a previously unrecognised human retrovirus that's entered the human population. Now, there were already two retroviruses known uh, in humans, and he further argued that if the new virus shares some antigenic characters with one of these known viruses, then maybe I could use the known virus, develop a serological test, and see if there are antibodies in AIDS uh, patients that react with one of these known viruses. If so, that would give us a clue that we need to be focusing our attention not on lifestyles, chemicals, uh, all of the other hypotheses that were put up for the cause of AIDS, but we should be focusing on looking for a retrovirus. So how did he do that? He collected blood samples from AIDS patients and matched controls, tested them against uh, H2LV1, which was one of the known human retroviruses, 48% of them were positive in his test. Only 1% in the controls. And looking at the controls, because they were uh, so well matched, it's quite likely that one of the controls was in the incubation period and hadn't uh, gone on to develop full-blown AIDS at that stage. The other group of people, one of the other groups that were affected with the AIDS uh, syndrome were people who had haemophilia. So he looked at blood samples from a large group of people suffering with haemophilia. 15% of them were positive in the test as well. And if he had a look at a subgroup of the haemophilia, those who had haemophilia, those who also had uh, suppression of their T lymphocytes and a particular subset of those, then 100% of those uh, were there. So this came as uh, a fairly good clue that those who were uh, working like uh, Robert Gallo uh, in the US, Luke Montagna at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, they went flat out looking for a retrovirus in human samples. And within uh, six months or so, they had isolated uh, the AIDS, AIDS virus. I nearly said they had independently isolated the AIDS virus. There's a huge controversy over whether Montagna found it, sent samples to Gallo, Gallo found it in those samples. Both of them have written a book and each of them have argued against the other, but uh, uh, Bob Gallo missed out on the Nobel Prize and uh, Luke Montagna uh, collected along with his, uh, uh, um, his, one of his co-workers. The next uh, example I wanted us to look at occurred in uh, 1999. And at that time, uh, a surprising outbreak of neurological disease occurred in people in uh, New York City and in the surrounding countryside. Uh, at the same time, neurological disease was appearing in horses in the same area as well. The third uh, part of the puzzle was that uh, corvid species of birds, crows and ravens, as well as jays, were dying in huge numbers. Some testing was done by the human health experts on the human patients, and they found that they had antibody that reacted to a well-recognised insect-transmitted virus in North America but it was one that only occurred in the southern part of the United States. And for some reason, this appeared to be occurring in, around New York City. St. Louis encephalitis virus was the one that they put it down to. They knew that that also infected horses, so that fitted in with what they were seeing. And they'd also, when they were thinking back to their virology days at medical school, said, ah, yes, it's um, mosquitoes, 
The virus is maintained in birds, mosquitoes transmit it to people and transmit it to horses and that's what we're seeing. So they weren't surprised at the birds dying. Tracy McNamara was the pathologist at the Bronx Zoo at the time and she looked at it and said, well, hang on, it can't be St. Louis encephalitis if all three of these different species being affected uh, and the, the crows are dying. Uh, the headline there, it's raining crows, was from one of the New York newspapers who uh, journalists are great at uh, creating uh, titles. I should have uh, consulted one when I was looking for the title for my talk tonight, perhaps. Um, it's raining crows. Tracy said, hang on, St. Louis encephalitis doesn't cause disease in crows. It's maintained in them, but they don't show signs of disease. So this has to be something, something else. She also did what any good uh, shoe leather epidemiologist would do. She had to look at what was going on in the bird collections at the zoo. And she noticed that birds in outside aviaries some species were getting this condition and dying. If, it were, if they were in inside aviaries, none of them were. She also noticed that the species of birds that were dying were all New World species of birds. None of them were African or European birds. They seemed to be quite safe. A bald eagle got the disease and died, so that really focused attention on things. Um, Tracy also did what a good pathologist does, is to do a post-mortem and have a look at lesions and tissues. And what she saw was good, strong evidence of a viral meningoencephalitis in these birds. So she sent samples off to the veterinary laboratories. They came back with, it's a virus, probably St. Louis encephalitis. She said, no, it isn't. Uh, now I understand she's quite a, an assertive lady. Uh, so she probably said that very firmly. Uh, she sent samples off to a human lab, uh, the uh, main uh, laboratories in the, uh, actually part of the US military service who run laboratories looking at these, uh, these things. They refused to accept samples from animals and said, we only look at human samples. Um, she said, no, you don't. And I think she said that firmly and finally got the samples looked at. And they said, hang on, we've got a new virus here. And it was West Nile virus. Sure, it, it caused people to, and animals to have antibodies that cross-reacted with St. Louis encephalitis. But her persistence, her approach to a diagnosis, uh, her combination of epidemiology, pathology, um, working through the diagnostic process, um, pinned down exactly what was going on. Some planes flew into the Twin Towers not long after that, so attention were swung right away from West Nile virus. And uh, the virus spread right across the United States. Uh, it hit uh, California about 18 months later, spread up into Canada. Uh, it killed lots of North American birds, drove some species almost to extinction. Um, fortunately, a vaccine was developed for horses quite quickly, so it was managed in that way. Um, so Tracy applying what she had learned at veterinary school and what she had also learned in her continuing education as a pathologist uh, was able to deal with that problem and solve it. The next one, and this is where we come back to Doug's uh, story, because in 2011, uh, cattle on farms around a little town in northwestern Germany, a little town of Schmullenberg, began showing uh, signs of disease that the practitioners had not observed before. They thought this was something quite different. They had high fever, diarrhoea and production loss. Samples were sent off to the veterinary laboratory and this time using modern uh, molecular, vi molecular virology techniques, they screened them for the whole range of uh, uh, viral genomes and discovered that there were in these samples uh, uh, evidence of a novel orthobunyavirus. And when they made this report, they said, OK, we found a new virus. These are the other, some of the other known viruses that are in the group. And the one that I put there in red, Akabani virus, is one that's quite well known in Australia. Uh, it was identified in Japan and it's caused outbreaks of disease in cattle and sheep in Egypt as well. Now, 
if you had a smartphone or a laptop, you could have followed this emerging disease on a day-by-day -day basis because ProMed, that wonderful uh, list serve, were putting out comments on what the latest findings were each day and the moderator was adding comments in about what this might mean. The moderator, when he saw what the virus was that was there, he said, right, these animals have been infected in mid-gestation. Uh, what vets ought to be doing is looking in about three months' time for whether we've got congenital abnormalities appearing in cattle. That's exactly what happened. Uh, firstly, it was seen in uh, the Netherlands because the virus with its uh, vectors had spread across the border. Hydronencephaly and arthrogryposis, the uh, very dramatic uh, lesions were seen first in sheep and subsequently in calves. Exactly the lesions that Doug Blood had described back in 1956 in the paper that he wrote uh, in the Australian Veterinary Journal when he was still speculating on what the possible causes were. And as he went through his list of speculations, he said, a few months before we saw these congenitally malformed calves, it was an unusually wet season. There was a very high number of insects, far more than had occurred before. Maybe this is an insect transmitted virus that's attacking uh, the cattle mid-gestation and that's why we are seeing uh, what we are. So if we go back to look at, uh, at Doug's uh, description and his speculations, the time from him describing that through to us identifying this as caused by Akabani virus, our own version of what has now become called Schmullenberg virus. It took about 20 years uh, for that to occur. Uh, fair enough, this was a new disease. There weren't any analogies uh, too much that we could go on, so it took some time uh, and it was pinned down to the particular vector. Uh, the whole thing was Schmullenberg virus. Within about three to four months, it was tied up as to the cause and the whole uh, sequence of what had happened. And uh, within about another six months, there was a vaccine developed that could be used uh, in cattle and in sheep in areas where the virus was likely to spread. So what are some of the other challenges and how are we addressing those in the 21st century? Uh, I got involved about six or seven years ago now in an outbreak of Q fever in a very large goat farm not very far from here. And the very first paper that came out of our studies on that farm uh, because the initial indications were people getting sick and being admitted to Geelong Hospital with Q fever. Uh, very first paper that came out, we headed up a One Health approach to controlling Q fever uh, in the scope farm. And if you went through looking at the uh, links of uh, where those authors and co-authors are working, you'll see it's a good mix of uh, medical infectious disease experts uh, molecular uh, microbiologists, veterinary virologists, uh, epidemiologists and so on in there. Um, since that outbreak and building on it, uh, Mark Stevenson, Simon Firestone uh, in uh, the Melbourne Veterinary School have put together a very large research project that's uh, just coming to the end of its first iteration that's involved a similar large group of people looking at environment, uh, wildlife, uh, goat farms, uh, vaccination, all of those aspects and has involved researchers in uh, the three eastern states and South Australia to, uh, to do that. So whilst the approaches are using the same basic approach, the need to work with other experts in a One Health uh, approach I think is becoming more and more obvious. I can't... Uh, sort of finished talking about examples without mentioning wildlife. Uh, we're well aware with all of the discussions around COVID that viruses present in wildlife can move across into people. Uh, similarly, we have viruses that can move from our domestic animals into wildlife populations and viruses that can come the other direction from wildlife into our domestic animal populations. Um, on the left, I have a graph showing, and if you look at the solid circles, that's the wildebeest uh, population size in the Serengeti uh, Park 
in uh, Tanzania. In 1960, there were rinderpest, our old friend again, rinderpest outbreaks occurring in the cattle properties surrounding the farm. Rinderpest spilled over into the wildebeest, into the wildebeest population. Did I say rinderpest or wildebeest? Rinderpest spilled across into the wildebeest population uh, and was decimating uh, the wildebeest herd. So they were only able to maintain their population at around 200,000 animals. As vaccination was practised and rinderpest was brought under control in the cattle farms, it disappeared from the wildebeest herd and the wildebeest numbers went up dramatically over that first decade and then stabilised, apart from a few fluctuations probably related to availability of feed, uh, how many crocodiles were in the river when they were trying to cross it and so on, but has now stabilised up around 1.2 million there. So a dramatic effect of a domestic animal disease going into a wildlife population. In Victoria in 2020, when we were all in lockdown and our focus in terms of infectious disease was pretty firmly on COVID-19, um, Agriculture Victoria had to deal with an outbreak of avian influenza uh, that occurred. It was an epizootic in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we had a fairly new uh, chief veterinary officer appointed from the UK at that time. And I almost think somebody thought, what can we give him to welcome him to Victoria? Let's give him an outbreak of uh, bird flu. Uh, let's put it in three different species. And because he's a Brit, let's give him emus. That'll be a good story to tell to his mates back home. And let's complicate it. We'll put three different flu viruses in there as well. So this was uh, really something, and then trying to manage it in the middle of a pandemic where the laboratory doing thousands of diagnostic tests each day to stay on top of this uh, were limited in the number of people who could be in a room at any one time. Uh, the reagents that they needed to use because they were running PCR tests too were the same reagents that the human health people were wanting for their COVID testing. Um, so there were some real challenges in there. But Anyway, the point I wanted to make is that we're going to be seeing more and more of these uh, sorts of challenges uh, during this century as we go on. Viruses as ecological and demographic changes occur, spreading from domestic animals into wildlife, from wildlife back into, uh, into our domestic animals. I think one of the biggest challenges that we need uh, to be thinking about in this century is uh, food security. Now, the Food and Agriculture Organisation of the UN has defined food security there, and it's a fairly uh, high bar to meet. It's when all people at all times have physical, social and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences. Uh, some have argued that food preferences shouldn't necessarily be there. But if you like salted caramel ice cream, then that is regarded as an essential uh, food. Um, but sufficient for an active and healthy lifestyle. And uh, we need to recognise that if there is an issue with food security, it's children who end up stunted, who are then less able to make a contribution to society as they go later on. And we have these cycles of food insecurity, lack of, uh, of development within society flowing on from it. Back in the 1960s, when Doug was establishing the Melbourne Veterinary School, food security was, uh, was a topic that was talked about a lot. And part of it was promoted by this book published by uh, Dr Paul Ehrlich, The Population Bomb. And uh, he was warning that human world global population was on a curve like that. If we kept going the way we were, uh, then we would not only run out of food, but we would degrade the environment so badly that the world would become uh, completely untenable. Uh, a fair enough point to be making at that time because the world population was growing rapidly. What's the situation now, uh, 60 years later on? Uh, we can see the graph on the left, the, uh, the hatch graph, uh, showing where we are, the first part of that graph at the moment. We're sitting at a world population of just under 8 billion people. But if you look at the continuing projection, 
and we all know about flattening the curve these days, we have that curve starting to flatten. And the predictions are that the world population, global population, will in fact peak and flatten off at somewhere between 10 and 11 billion people. And the reason for that is that uh, whether Paul Ehrlich prompted it or whether people were aware of it and prompted to take action uh, is that the fertility rate throughout the world has dropped dramatically. Uh, if we look at the graph on the right, that is the average fertility rate throughout the world. In 1960s, when Paul wrote his book, about five children per woman of uh, childbearing age. That has now dropped to just above two. That's the average throughout the world. Now, to maintain a stable population, you actually need 2.1 um, infants per, uh, per woman uh, during childbearing age. I think the point one is to cope for teenage boys driving high-powered cars uh, <laughs> so that we have to get a little above, above the two. Now, that is the same figure if I put up the graph for Bangladesh. It would be there. Um, you wouldn't be surprised that that is also the figure for India. Uh, well, you may be surprised for India. You wouldn't be surprised if I said it's the figure for China as well. So that has been a change. There are still some countries that are running at six or seven for their fertility rate, and they are having issues. So what was done to bring it down to that point? And I'm pleased to say that they're nice things that were done. Uh, we didn't have to take the draconian measures that, uh, that China took with their one-child policy and uh, forced abortions and sterilisations and so on. Uh, three things were actually done. The first thing was to address maternal and child health so that kids were healthy and survived in those first few years of life. The second thing was to provide the means of girls staying in school. So they then had careers. And instead of getting married at 14 and starting to have children, they were now establishing careers and taking charge of their own lives and deciding on what sort of family and what sort of family size they wanted. And the third component there was making sure that there were a range of contraceptive uh, means available and education in how to use these and how to manage them. And it was then left to the people to do that. The education uh, campaigns continued on, but there was no need for any, any forced measure. So that's how that's been achieved. A lot of people that I talk to, I find their thinking is still stuck in the 1960s. Um, it's all those people that have slightly darker skin than ours that are breeding uh, frantically and, and overpopulating the world and we're now going to hell in a handbasket. But there are issues, there are problems, there are challenges, but we need to take encouragement that we can successfully manage, manage them. What's the situation at the moment in terms of uh, food security? The world population, as I said, about 7.9 to 8 billion. There's more than enough food produced in the world at the moment to feed everybody. Uh, but clearly not everybody is getting sufficient food and for some we're getting far more food than we need. Uh, so even though there's sufficient food being produced in the world as a whole, nearly 700 million people are considered as being food insecure. And in fact that number has gone up uh, since the COVID outbreak hit the world. And that gives us a bit of a clue as to why some of the food insecurity occurs because COVID uh, outbreak disrupted supply routes, uh, wiped out people's ability to earn money to purchase food. Um, so other things than just having a pile of food around you. The other important factor is that about a third of the food that we produce is wasted. It's not actually eaten and used. If you look in industrialised countries, most of that wastage occurs at the kitchen, restaurant, supermarket end of the food chain. If you go into developing countries, most of the wastage occurs on farm uh, due to disease in animal and plant populations on the farm. During process, um, inadequate ability to store food safely and then inefficient transportation systems. So wherever one wants to address food security, there's not going to be one simple answer for any one part of it. Things uh, need to be tailored. 
Another figure that uh, surprised me the first time I saw it, but about a third of all the food that's produced in the world is produced by smallholder farmers. Uh, this is people who have less than two hectares of land. I have spent a bit of time the last uh, eight or nine years in Cambodia and I thought I would just use a typical uh, village situation in Cambodia to look at what food security looks like there. And I think you would have to conclude if you uh, were thinking in terms of a share portfolio rather than food security, what they have in these situations is a diverse portfolio. Uh, if you go into the average uh, family dwelling in a village in Cambodia, there'll be a pig or two. There'll be some ducks, probably. Uh, there'll be some vegetable crops. There'll certainly be chickens, always chickens. There may be one or two cattle as well. Much of that is to feed the family. It's going to be consumed on the family or bartered with others uh, within the village. Other cash crops may be grown that are going to be sold and with the huge tourist uh, industry in Cambodia, there's a very big market for growing the sorts of things that are going to appear on plates in restaurants in Phnom Penh or in the tourist hotels in Phnom Penh. So people in the villages have cashed in on that and are getting a cash income as well. So they're producing actual food that they're going to use. They're also generating a cash income. Cambodia, by the way, produces twice as much rice as it needs to feed its own population, so there's uh, ability there to sell that as a cash crop. The rice is also rather cleverly managed. It's uh, mostly paddy rice. You can't see them, but there are fish being grown in the water, in the rice fields. And there are also these uh, flocks of ducks that are brought on when the rice has been harvested. They are grazed over the rice stubble. They pick up the uh, uh, spilt grain that's been lost. They clean up a lot of the other pests that are present in there. If we have a look at the demographics uh, in one of these villages, you'll often find that it's grandfather looking after the younger children and the older of the younger children looking after the younger, younger children. Mum will be looking after the chickens and the pig and doing a lot of the uh, uh, work in the fields as well as the rest of the family. The burden that falls on women in, uh, in countries like this dramatically. You often won't find the father in the village. He'll be in Phnom Penh or one of the other tourist resorts driving a tuk-tuk, generating a cash income. The older teenage daughter also has gone off to work in one of the garment factories. So we have a cash income there. So what is the threat to that sort of food security diverse portfolio look like? African swine fever swept through Cambodia a couple of years ago, killing off most of the pigs. And it also shook people's confidence in keeping pigs. So they've gone right away from rearing pigs. So that's one source that's gone. We have hemorrhagic septicemia outbreaks affecting cattle. We have foot and mouth disease and we've had recent outbreaks of lumpy skin disease in cattle. In our poultry, we have regular outbreaks of bird flu and we have Newcastle disease occurring there as well. So if we're looking for a role where veterinarians can play a role in food security, um, there's certainly opportunities for that in that situation. Now, I'm not suggesting we need lots of Australian vets running over there and uh, vaccinating and treating cattle. Uh, there's a veterinary school at Royal Agricultural University and uh, Doug Blood uh, produced a curriculum here that I learnt my veterinary science through um, before I went on to learn some other things as well. I was appointed as a consultant with Asian Development Bank to develop a curriculum for the veterinary school at RUA. Remarkably, it's very similar to the curriculum that Doug put together back then. <laughs> um, I had to look at what staff were available for teaching, what was the essential stuff that really needed to be in there. And this now is the crop of uh, that next group of local Cambodian veterinarians 
who are going to be addressing the issues uh, in Cambodia. They still need an awful lot of help. Uh, this particular group were carrying out their vaccination campaign against rabies in domestic dogs. About a thousand people a year die of rabies in, uh, in Cambodia. So uh, it's been a, an honour and a privilege for me to uh, uh, present this oration in honour of, uh, of Doug Blood. I recognise him and value uh, his contribution to my career, my education. A uh, very great man. And uh, I hope he'd be a little pleased that uh, his influence on some of his students is now flowing on to students in other veterinary schools in other places. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.